Hello class, welcome to this lecture on two Ortegas, a contemporary Mariana Ortega and a historical Ortega y Gasset, in which we'll cover Latina or Latinx and Spanish existentialism. We could tell in studying Ansel Dua on the concept of Nepantla, the very profound, indeed properly existential and spiritual world conception and conception of the self is at stake. Mariana Ortega will be particularly important here insofar as she situates many of Ansel Dua's insights both within contemporary cultural studies and within post-Heideggerian philosophy. In addition, providing many of her own novel insights and in a way inaugurating explicitly the field of Latinx phenomenology and existentialism. Ortega's main areas of research and interest are women of color feminisms, in particular Latina feminisms, 20th century continental philosophy, phenomenology, especially Heidegger, philosophy of race and aesthetics. Her research focuses on questions of self, identity, as well as visual representations of race, gender, and sexuality. We'll be reading two chapters of her book, In Between, Latina Feminist Phenomenology, Multiplicity, and the Self, in which she presents a theory of multiplicitous selfhood informed by women of color theorizing, in particular, Latina feminism and Heideggerian phenomenology. The first chapter assigned from Ortega is the new Mestiza and La Nepentlera which reckons up the pros and cons of Gloria Ansel Dua's exploration of selfhood. The epigraph to this chapter is a quote from Gloria Ansel Dua when she writes, I'd like to create a different sense of self, Linda Pantlera, that does not rest on external forms of identification of family, race, gender, sexuality, class, or nationality, or attachments to power, privilege, and control, or romanticized self-images. But can we even talk about ourselves in ways that do not rest on some notion of identity, when identity is the means by which we, both individuals and groups, attempt to create a sense of security and belonging in the midst of a fast-paced, ever-changing world? Ortega is going to try to answer Ansel to his questions here. Let's first do a little digression and review on Ansel Dua's own conceptions of identity and the role of the Pantla or the Nepantlera within them explored in later chapters, not in this class assigned, from her posthumously published doctoral dissertation, Light in the Dark, Rewriting Identity, Spirituality, and Reality. In chapter 4 of that work, Anza Dua defines the body self as sexed, raced, classed, colonized by ideology, and always undergoing deconstructive and reconstructive processes. These categories and others are defined in terms of binaries. However, identity is not a binary but moves across binaries. Their notion of identity not being understandable, then strict opposition, rather as a triune process always involving identity capital, identity formation, and identity performance. A graph here that Ansel Dewitt does not herself invoke, but which is pretty helpful at getting to what she's saying about identity. Dewitt in this chapter introduces the fundamental concept in Spanish of nos otras, that is us others or we others. The slash in nosotros means us other, and it is a cleft or a rajadura. The word itself in Spanish, nosotras, simply means we. What it literally says, though, especially with the slash, is we others. Linguistically, it is significant that such a we or us is comprised of a composite or plurality of others. This encodes into this basic pronoun a recognition that we are all insiders and outsiders, especially when we identify with a group. The liminal ambiguity in the pronoun itself is our difference beyond collective identity. We are both subject and object, self and other, have and have nots, conqueror and conquered, oppressor and oppressed. The very sense of identity is always defined by both the proximity and the intimacy of irreconcilable aspects of the self. And for Ansel Dua here, us versus them, mentality or the friend enemy distinction is an abdication of identity. No wall can change the fact that we are increasingly mixed and are becoming a geography of hybrid selves of different cities or countries who all stand at the threshold of many worlds. Here you see on the right one of Ansel Dua's own diagrams of the Mestiza Nosotros relation, which is interchangeable within the clefts of the self. There are always two selves, the hybridized or mixed Mestiza and the process of identification, we others. This doubling of the self within the self along the permeable membrane or slash rajadura of nosotros disrupts binary oppositions and overcomes the subjective we versus others they, which is always a relation of dominance and subordination. Those who are thrown into and must integrate a mestiza identity 
increasingly become a geography of hybrid selves. And in this way, a nosotras perspective becomes a lugares nepantleras, or perspective from the cracks. Dwelling in the minalities in between states or nepantlas, the nepantleras refuse to turn right onto the dominant culture's assimilation acquiescence highway. They also refuse to turn left onto a nationalistic isolationist path demanding that they preserve ethnic cultural integrity. Instead, Las Nepantleras construct alternative roads, creating new topographies and geographies of hybrid selves, who transcend binaries and depolarize potential allies. Nepantleras are not constructed by one culture or world, but experience multiple realities. An insight here that Ortega will draw from into her concept of multiplicitous selves. In another of Ansel Dua's informative diagrams, identity is always under reconstruction, like a house, and thus always being destroyed or torn apart, the process of shamanic dismemberment, the coatli quay state in the Pantla, as well as reconstruction or the aesthetic imperative, the daughter of coatli quay called Kwakui, the moon. Within this process, there is always an old identity and a reconstructed self. Nepantlera, always undergoing this process of deconstruction and reconstruction, experiences themselves at every phase of this process of identity, once though from various angles. In fact, Nepantleras come to trouble the nos otras distinction, that is to remove the slash, wherever they question the subject's privilege, confronting their own personal desconocimientos, or regions of oblivion and ignorance in the self, and are thus always challenging the other's marginal status. Nepantleras recognize that all of us are complicit in existing power structures, and that we must deal with conflictual as well as connectionist relations within and among various groups. And so they nurture psychological, social, and spiritual metamorphosis. In fact, Nepantleras challenge traditional identity politics. Dismantling identity entails unlearning stereotypical labels and questioning consensual reality. Those who live in other worlds, like the Nepantleras, do have a unique perspective. And here Ansel Dua notes the breaches in feminism, the rifts in Rasa studies, the breaks in our discipline, the splits in this country. Quotes Canadian songwriter Leonard Cohen, there is a crack, a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. For Ansel Dua, the mestiza or hybrid self is a cosmopolitan, citizen of the world and the future. Les Nepantleras learn to move at ease among cultures, countries, and customs. And the future belongs who cultivate cultural sensitivities to others recognizing and engaging in the nos otras imperative, that is, of removing the slash, will take concerted effort by members of all communities cooperating with others. Here we must heal wounds and grieve our losses. For racialized people, managing losses, the trauma of racism, and other colonial abuses affect our self-conceptions, our very identity, fragmenting our psyches and pitching us into states of Nepantla. Nepantleras never forget their wounds, and La Lorona, or the Dark Mother, with her perpetual morning song, has haunted the Chicanx Nepantleras for 500 years as a symbol of unresolved grief and an ever-present specter in the psyches of Chicanos and Mexicanos. In times of chaos and Zaldúa, just to dig deep into El Cenote, the source, the archetypal wellsprings of culture. El Cenote being another indigenous word or palabra indígena that reflects both the traditional culture as well as Ansel Dua's debt to James Hillman and Jungian psychology. In an important appendix to Light in the Dark, we read identity is a composition of a composite, that is, a framework for complex composition that melts together disparate persons. Identity is an ongoing activity of constructing an ordered latticework of time, space, emotional climate, and of stringing together a series of scenes and experiences and holding all these together by memory. Memory is the adhesive and the myths of your tribe, and what may be called the collective dream are the narratives that your fiction is embedded in. In this way, Ansel Dua defines identity as a field of relations or a field of subpersonalities. If this is what identity is, then the task must become to decolonize identity in the usual sense by neuristic subjects. Ultimately, reality is made up, and so too is identity. It is the imagination's shape-shifting power, what she calls la naguala, enables us to shift identities. Colonizing mainstream identities consists of unlearning their labels, and this means unlearning consensual reality. This basic philosophical perspective on identity in Ansel Dua points back to Borderlands, where she spoke of identity, the whole, complete, or total self, not only as a synthesis of opposites, 
but as a third perspective that is transcending the Hegelian dialectic. She, Coetli Quay, in Borderlands, represents duality in life, a synthesis of duality, and a third perspective, something more than mere duality or a synthesis of duality. This third perspective will now be important as we return to Ortega on Ansel Dua and identity politics. Ortega underlines that one of the most important aspects of Ansel Dua's later description of the self is her rejection of what she calls, quote, an oppositional form of identity politics. In Ansel Dua's view, the oppositional aspect of identity politics stems from the fact that binaries are created in the process of forging identities, for example, us, them, gay, straight, able, disabled, and so on. Groups find themselves opposing the other side of the binary. Ansel Dua rejects this establishment of binaries and notes that identity politics sets itself up for failure. Her notion of la mestiza, la nepantlera, and removing the slash in nosotras, as well as her compositional model of identity, always in the process of flux and reconstruction, framed as a critique of identity politics per se. And yet, as Martin Alkoff notes, identity politics is a complex notion and has multiple meanings. And we still need to underscore the importance of identity to personhood and to political work. And Zaldua indeed acknowledges and promotes this perspective in her early work, and retains aspects of it in her later critique of identity politics, so Ortega turns to her as someone whose views on these topics is helpful and complex, although not without its critical aporias, as we'll now see. For Ortega, Ansel Dua's work in the early and late period contests identifications and calls for a more inclusive vision of self and identity, such as Lenne Pantlera, as well as a new tribalism, which she describes as expanded identity. As Anna Louise Keatings notes, Nosotras affirms collectivity while at the same time it recognizes difference and divisiveness and allows for the possibility of healing by understanding that we contain the others and the others contain us. And here Ortega introduces a critique of Ansel Dua. While I understand Ansel Dua's concern regarding the narrowing, essentializing, and homogenizing aspect of identity categories, I wonder about her desire for a time when we do not have to appeal to our racial identities or other types of identities. Where Ansel Dua's critique of identity politics is coming from is her earlier notion of El Mundo Zerdo, or the left-handed world. One of her earliest writings, La Prieta, she had an inclusive vision of this left-handed world as an inclusive community in which members of different groups are able to form coalitions regardless of different ideologies and affinities. The collective world is here, according to Ansel Dua, a network of kindred spirits, a kind of family that works for change allows the formation of alliance is the condition of not fitting in society or being the queer group that doesn't belong anywhere. And this leads to Ortega's analysis of Ansel Dua on mestiza and mestizaje. Mestizaje, or race mixing, particularly between Europeans and Immer Indians, has a long history, from its early uses when the Spanish arrived in the New World to Vasconcelos' understanding of it as he developed the idea of la raza cosmica, to Chicano contemporary understandings of a critical mestizaje understands itself as embedded in a legacy of colonial struggle and moving through new configurations of resistant identities. Even though mestizaje is generally understood in terms of racial mixing, Ansel Dua's use of the concept is not one that prioritizes the racial dimension. For Ansel Dua, the new mestiza is a notion that is more inclusive than racial mestizaje. And here, mestiza consciousness involves situatedness, in-betweenness, and tolerance for ambiguity and contradiction. Ansel Dua's notion of the self being developed from the deeply phenomenological aspects of her lived experience in the borderlands or Napantla. And so we arrive at the ballad-ish criticism of Ansel Dua. Borderlands was narrated from a first world person perspective, and this is the reason why Ansel Dua's discussion is criticized for being overly metaphorical. It is indeed the case that if we think about the border from the perspective of those who are on the Mexican side, it is impossible to miss the specific material geopolitical situation that Mexicans face. From the point of view of the United States, however, it becomes more possible to minimize this geopolitical situation and underscore the metaphorical aspect of the border. It becomes easier, in short, to think abstractly about the border. For Ortega, as readers and admirers of Ansel Dua's work, we need to be aware of this first world point of view, which informs Ansel Dua's depiction of that open wound that is the U.S.-Mexico border. Ortega's view, the choice of mestizaje or critical mestizaje as a leading metaphor 
in Ansel Dua's account of the self is both highly problematic and also constructive. That there is a contradictory aspect to Ansel Dua's account of the self is not surprising, as the notion of contradiction plays a crucial role in Ansel Dua's view of the new mestiza. Contradictions can be used productively, and Ortega notes she has learned here both from Ansel Dua and Nietzsche. Nevertheless, another criticism of Ansel Dua is more worrisome. According to Saldana Portillo, a serious problem with Ansel Dua's appeal to the new mestiza and her connection to the Aztec goddesses like Coatlicue or Coatquaqui is that while it romanticizes the indigenous past, it actually silences present indigenous peoples and their concerns, ultimately keeping aspects of indigenous culture as ornamentation in Chicanx identity. This is in fact a serious tension that runs across Ansel Dua's work. On the one hand, she privileges the development of what she calls La Facultad, a kind of psychic superpower that confers privilege on the new mestiza, not automatically derived from the experience of liminality or from sharing an indigenous heritage. This notion of la facultad extracts in part from real indigenous heritage and indemnifies the first world perspective, subject to the same criticisms and, fit and pitfalls of early standpoint theories, since in effect, it essentializes the marginalized and reifies their epistemic privilege. Indeed, Ansel Dua herself makes comments regarding Chicanas or Chicanos that do have an essentialist tone, despite the fact that the very notion of the new mestiza in the Pantla counters simple dichotomies and essentialisms. Ansel Dua is aware of this issue and attempts to navigate the potential quagmire, commenting that she was not born in Tenochtitlan in the ancient past or in a contemporary Aztec village. Beware of the romance of mestizaje, I hear myself saying silently, it might be a fiction, but I and other writers and artists have invested ourselves in it. Here, Ortega embraces Ansel Dua's vision of selfhood while also being aware of the dangers of her emphasis on mestizaje in creating and representing Latina subjectivity. As Velasco and Trianoski write, the central challenge for those advocating a theory of identity based in the notion of mestizaje is to do so without being drawn into the essentialist quagmire. Despite this criticism, Ansel Dua's emphasis on personal inner struggle and commitment to social change is one of the most powerful aspects of her writing. Throughout her work, she emphasizes collective transformation, reconfiguration, and the creation of new norms that defy oppression. And there is a powerful way of reading the shamanic theme of La Naguala, personal muse and daimon, and La Facultad, the powers bestowed therein, which is positively liberational and leads to an apantla perspective. That is, as one more capable of transformation, as well as developing a critical stance. Increasingly, in Ansel Dua's later work, she highlights the question of collective transformation and resistance, suggests how Lena Pantlera can guide and facilitate crossings for others. Tega locates here the most productive aspect of Ansel Dua's meditations on the self and identity, that is the deeply personal, it's socially oriented, transformative Latina feminist phenomenology on which it is grounded. For Ortega, the biggest issue in Ansel Dua's account of selfhood is her wavering between unity, totality, wholeness, and multiplicity. And in this way, she speaks of a mestizaje of multiplicity and of oneness, as capturing both one's existential sense of being a continuous self, as well as the recognition and importance of one's various identities. The mestizaje perspective points to alternative visions of the self that go beyond traditional unified epistemic subjects, as well as beyond phenomenological views of subjectivity in the European tradition. A bit further on, Ortega claims that Ansel Dua can productively contribute to deepening existential, phenomenological, and pragmatist philosophical views of identity due to their omission of the lived experience of selves in the borderlands or in betweenness. These are strong and I think correct claims, although if they are correct, the issue then becomes that of differentiating Ansel Dua's view of the self as a wholeness or totality, a simple reinstantiation of the claims of analytic psychology regarding healing and the archetypes. Differentiating the unified and multiplicitous dimensions of Ansel Dua's account of the self and personal identity is not an easy task. In many passages, she seems almost to overstep her own Nepantla perspective or perspective from the cracks in order to unify with a greater power than the conscious eye. This is Ansel Dua's spirituality. She describes as that power in my inner self, that entity that is the sum total of all my reincarnations, the God-woman in me I call Antigua, me Diosa, the divine within, 
followed by a litany of Aztec Comchicana goddesses, simply stating they are one. And further, and suddenly I feel everything rushing to a center, a nucleus, all the lost pieces of myself come flying from the deserts and the mountains and the valleys, magnetized towards that center, completa. Ortega notes, in these comments, Anzaldu appeals to a unifying sense for the new mestiza, and she even writes about her total self and the possibility of the end of the inner struggle that one has while living in the borderlands, an experience of true integration. Light in the Dark is still structured by this quest for true integration, part explaining its lack of completion and trailing off in the final chapter. In most sections of Borderlands, however, she emphasizes duality or plurality in La Mestiza, which leads Ortega to wonder about the importance of her occasional comments regarding the unity, integration, and totality of the self. Ortega proceeds to ask a bunch of tough questions. Are these comments on the total self products of Enzaldúa's wishful thinking at precarious moments when her psychic restlessness and the intimate terrorism of life at the border or borderlands seem too much to bear? Or do they point to her view that despite the plurality and multiplicity of the new mestiza, Anzaldúa hopes for some sort of unifying principle or integration of the self's multiple aspects? One thing seems certain, unity or totality for Anzaldúa cannot be thought in the traditional sense, as she herself notes, I fear a unity that leaves out parts of me, that colonizes me, that violates my integrity, my wholeness, and chips away at my autonomy. Ortega wonders if it's here a question of attempting to save Anzaldúa from her own spirituality. In the very same writings, she discusses not only the unity of the self, but also paradoxically the self's plurality or multiplicity in terms of the idea of layered selves as well as the idea of personas and reincarnations. It is thus very difficult to fully grasp Anzaldúa's views. At times she appeals to the new mestiza's total self, and at other times still she seems to be discussing what Ortega would call a multiplicitous self. We must begin sorting out these various notions of the self and identity construction in Anzaldúa by acknowledging her deep spirituality. The spiritual aspect of her vision must not be forgotten as we attempt to grasp her understanding of selfhood. It might be the case that the sense of oneness and totality that Anzaldúa experiences and brings into the discussion of the self may be seen as a product of a deeply personal spiritual inner experience that cannot be easily described or readily understood by someone else, especially those who do not accept spirituality or the spirit world. Or in Anzaldúa's own words, spirituality is a subjective experience, never to be fully rehabilitated to the whole of society in the scientific mode of observable phenomena. But how should we sort out this issue of the total self versus the layered self in Anzaldúa? She describes the greater self or total self as guiding her in many ways, even giving her instructions on how she should live, instructions that the little me or sub-selves don't know. And Anzaldúa attempts to listen to this voice, especially in light of her diabetes diagnosis, which herself before it, which was too spiritual, too out of this world, total self reflects in Anzaldúa the larger force of the universe, the divine, and the sense of feeling interconnected with all aspects of oneself, the universe, and the spirit world. For her, there is always a deep connection between one's sense of self and the material and spiritual worlds. Concluding this chapter on the connection between la numestisa, la nepentlera, the nature of identity, nosotras, and the total self versus the layered or multiplicitous self, Ortega writes, Anzaldúa's account of self remains multiple in her writing as shape-shifting and presents different or transformed visions of self and identity, sometimes emphasizing multiplicity, at other times oneness and totality, sometimes appealing to oppositional identity while at the same time criticizing such an account. And she notes, as we did earlier, that inspired by the goddess Coetlique, Anzaldúa, like Coetlique, treats selfhood in multiple modes, duality in life, the synthesis of duality, as well as a third perspective, something more, than mere duality or its synthesis. As multiple, the self has various social identities. As one, the self has a sense of being an I. For Ortega, an existential sense of ownness, but also a sense of being a totality. This totality can be understood through what Anzaldúa describes as the Colquaqui imperative, a myth that Anzaldúa appeals to in order to bring light to the situation of contemporary women, their split between body, mind, spirit, and soul. In short, Ansel Dua's meditations on selfhood promotes a self that has a sense of being an I, existentially and spiritually, 
the possibility of being a whole, of healing and integration, as well as a self that remains multiple, yet one. And it is now through this parsing of Ansel Dua's notion of the self and identity that its relevance for the phenomenological and existential tradition can become clear as Ortega turns to her account of being between worlds and being in worlds. This chapter being the most cogent attempt to demonstrate the relevance of Ansel Dua and Maria Lugona's thought for the post-Heideggerian legacy of continental philosophy. The epigraph to this chapter, now in Ortega's own words and reflecting her indebtedness to both Lugonis and Ansel Dua, I am multiplicitous, multiple and one, psychic restlessness, intimate terrorism, cactus needles embedded in my skin and in my words, Latina de las otras, daughter, sister, lover, student, teacher, philosopher, English, Spanish, other languages but not of words, of worlds, many of them, in confusion, pain, paralysis, creation, transformation between. The main point of this chapter is to the main point of this chapter is to understand the in-between self in terms of being in the world. It's an excellent introduction to Chicanek's modifications of Heidegger's notion of Dasein, which we'll cover more in depth in the coming weeks. It is Ortega's hope that the intertwining of Latina feminism and Heideggerian phenomenology discloses a better understanding of the complexity of the experience of these selves who remain at the margins, not only of traditional philosophical investigations, but also of society. Now, Ortega is not claiming that Heidegger and Ansel Dua are sometimes saying the same thing about the self as being in the world, only that there are significant crisscrossings. For example, both Heideggerian and Latina feminist phenomenology constitutes a critique against Cartesian epistemic subjectivity, in which the subject is understood as a substance or a thinking thing. A major difference is that Ansel Dua's writing is more deeply personal. We could say, in Heidegger's own terminology, that it pursues an existential ethos, existence as it is lived, rather than strictly ontological goals within the traditional language of formal philosophy, although to some extent this difference applies more to being in time than Heidegger's own later works. Heidegger claims that the essence of this entity, Dasein, lies in its to be. In other words, human beings do not have an essence but make themselves through living, through making choices. This brings Heidegger a little bit too close to Sartrean existentialism in my view. The points Ortega draws from this are fine as far as they go in terms of an existential reading of Heidegger. Rather than accepting the traditional understanding of selfhood as a substance in which a number of set properties inhere, Heidegger understands the self as always in process, in the making. And so, another great similarity, neither Dasein nor the new Mestiza are substantial entities. They are existential selves that make themselves to their choices. Additionally, Heidegger and Sildua and other Latina feminists share a view of the self as thrown. I'm not sure about the claim that Heidegger emphasizes how projection is not always thematic or reflective, whereas Ansel Dua does not. The idea that the new mestiza is a consciousness oriented, a reflexivity on the path to knowledge or conocimiento, seems valid enough, but it may be that only the Dasein of Division I, that is, of inauthenticity and everydayness, is indeed always and primarily non-reflective in the sense Ortega underlines. What Heideggerian and Latina feminist phenomenology of the self basically agree on is that the self is a worldly thrown projection that is anxious. The characteristic of this self that is thrown and defines itself by its choices is the mood of anxiety, angst, a mood that Heidegger connects to Dasein's potential for living authentically. As well, in Ansel Dua's account, a sense of anxiety permeates the life of the noon mestiza. In this instance, anxiety is also connected to the possibility of choice, and especially to the fact that the noon mestiza has to cross to cross worlds, borders, and ways of life. Reading both as existentialists, Ortega writes, while in the Heideggerian view, anxiety discloses a self not at home in the world. In the Ansel Duan story, anxiety is connected with paralysis and an inability to make choices. Here the plot thickens and hints. The Heideggerian account of authenticity in Division 2 might end up being deficient in some way. When we attempt to understand the transition from inauthenticity to authenticity, in marginalized subjectivities. In any case, methodologically, anxiety plays similar roles in both accounts since it is through anxiety that the self becomes capable of ultimately making choices that are not expected or prescribed. Anxiety is part and parcel of being human and of recognizing 
the familiar existential call for creating one's own essence through one's own choices. Again, in my view, overly assimilating the Heideggerian to the Sartrean existential approach. Nevertheless, a further similarity is that both Heidegger and Ansel Dua reject the subject-object dichotomy, but here their motivations somewhat differ, Heidegger's desire being to overturn a substantialist, primarily epistemic account of the subject, Descartes, and Ansel Dua's from personal and political circumstances make the subject-object distinction and other dichotomies problematic. Ansel Dua and other Latina feminists like Lugonis are staunch critics of dichotomous views and worlds that arise out of such views always arranged in terms of dualities. While their motivations may be different, both the Heideggerian and the Ansel Duin critique of the subject-object duality arrives at more or less the same outcome, that is, a more deeply attuned interrelatedness of self and world, including the relationship among selves, Mitzayn. Next, both Heidegger and Ansel Dua include consideration of the importance of situatedness and history in their work. In Heidegger, Dasein is historical in light of being temporal. What Dasein essentially is, is time or historical temporality. Ansel Dua does not abstract to this level, does not reach this level of philosophical abstraction, but her interest in history is more concerned with resurrecting and reinterpreting ancient history and myth that have informed Mexican and Mexican-American culture. I think this point of differentiation of Heidegger and Ansel Dua is also a little problematic, since in many less technical works and also in the margins of being in time, Heidegger's goal as well is the recovery of a specifically German and Greek situatedness and historicity. In other words, both Heidegger and Ansel Dua have their cherished myths of history and histories of myth. Heidegger's approach in being in time at least, being more focused on the mainstream philosophical tradition of Logos. Ortega now arrives at a more key difference, that is the political stances of the writers. Heidegger having chosen to support in 1933 an unforgivable political position and Latina feminists choosing to write in defense of those who are marginalized. Correlatively, instead of providing a general account of the self's existential structures as Heidegger does, Latina feminists find themselves fully engaged with concrete and particular aspect of the self's existence, which Heidegger would regard as ontic. Regardless of our eventual moral or political conclusions after looking into the Heidegger controversy, and here many positions could be taken. I think that Ortega's main point here is correct. It is quite difficult in Heidegger to find accounts and ethical engagements with marginalized subjectivity. Impossible, but it's certainly not a forefront theme in his work. Despite this major difference, thinking about the experience of the new mestiza, together with the Heideggerian description of Dasein, reveals an important difference between the new mestiza's experience and Dasein's. That is the ruptures in her everyday existence, given her multiple social, cultural, and spatial locations, prompts her to become more reflective of her activities and her existence that we may describe as a life of not being at ease. Here, Ortega distinguishes a thin and thick sense of not being at ease. The thin sense might be a minimal rupture of everyday practice, such as Heidegger's analysis of the broken tool as ready to hand in Division I. The thick sense of not being at ease, the experience of a deeper sense of not being familiar with norms, practices, and contradictory feelings about who we are, given our experience in the different worlds we inhabit and whether those worlds are welcoming or threatening. Here, Lugonis is developing from Lugonis' conception of being at ease in the world, which we studied last week. I think if we dug a little deeper, we'd also find a thick sense of not being at ease across Heidegger, especially in his analysis of uncanniness, we might even find a focus on the uncanniness of some marginalized subjects like Antigone in the play by Sophocles in his later writings. Ortega interprets the Heideggerian account of practical, non-thematic, everyday orientation to the world as indicating a sense of being at ease. This is not to say that in the Heideggerian account human beings are always at ease. Heidegger provides an important account of instances when equipment breaks down and the self engages in a more thematic and reflective stance. In addition to providing discussions related to the breaking down of equipment, he provides elaborate descriptions of more essentially profound moments that include anxiety, being towards death, and resoluteness and Schlossenheit. Ortega's point here is only to note that the experience of the selves described by Ansel Dua, Lugonis, and other Latina theorists include a lived experience of constantly not being at ease due to the numerous ruptures or tears of everyday norms and practices. The numerous, deeper existential moments that they experience, the confusions and contradictions about their selves, 
and the unwelcoming, threatening nature of their experiences. A potentially very helpful point of connection here is Heidegger on the ready to hand versus Ansel Dua on Los Atravesados. The selves described by Latina feminists continually experience not being at ease or tears in the fabric of everyday experience while performing practices for the dominant group that are for the most part non-reflective, customary and readily available. The Mexican worker is treated very much like what Heidegger calls a ready-to-hand tool. And even more alienated, los atravesados, those who cannot pass, and who are most marginalized with respect to the dominant construction of free and authentic selfhood, are constantly having such ruptures, as well as deeper experiences of alienation, not feeling at home, and questioning their very sense of self. And here we find an important Ansel Duin contribution for existential phenomenologists have not written extensively enough about the importance of the kind of knowledge that arises out of such conditions of alienation and marginalization. I think this claim is true in regards to the birth of phenomenology and existentialism from the 20s to the 30s and part of the 40s. But by the 50s, 60s, and 70s, many thinkers associated with existential phenomenology do provide accounts of social alienation and marginalization, although they're often not with the same lucid force and intensity as Ansel Dua does. Next, Ortega examines the notions of temporality and mindness, and Heidegger as helpful ontological elements that allow us to understand a multiplicitous self's continuity of experience. For having a sense of continuity is key for multiplicitous selves, and not having a sense of continuity would render a self's experience merely unrelated atomistic moments. The multiplicitous self, in each moment of experience, is not only a this self, but myself. As in Heidegger, the experience of selfhood, like all the other experiences of Dasein, are characterized by mindness, Gemeinigkeit. However, this mindness is always in a state of flux. The unanticipated future arriving, a present experience of Dasein or the self that is mine, that is my experience, and then passing into the past, from which the future is opened up and projected, always for a temporal moment. And so, if multiplicitous selves are to be experienced as selves, if this continuity completely broke down, we wouldn't be able to speak of a multiplicitous self, but rather of a multiple personality disorder of some kind. For Ortega, in view of the phenomena of temporality, the multiplicitous self experiences a flow experience that she can recognize as her own. The events that happen to me are mine, and this is what Heidegger called mindness, and is an important ontological feature without which we cannot understand the oneness of the multiplicitous self. Ortega distinguishes her current view from a previous one. While I previously held this ontological feature accounted for the self's togetherness, I now understand it as a way of being with the self that arises from the type of temporality described above. This amounts to Ortega saying she's become more Heideggerian. On complexity, ambiguity, and contradiction, Themes also analyzed in Division 1 of Being in Time, she writes, the new mestiza copes by developing a tolerance for contradictions, a tolerance for ambiguity. She learns to be an Indian in Mexican cultures, to be a Mexican from an Anglo point of view. She learns to juggle cultures and has a plural personality operating in a pluralistic mode. Nothing is thrust out, the good and the bad and the ugly, nothing rejected, nothing abandoned. Not only does she sustain contradictions, she turns the ambivalence into something else. For Ortega here, by focusing on these Latinx experiences of complexity, ambiguity, and contradiction, we may in fact be able to enhance the analysis given of them in more traditional existential phenomenology. In the conclusion of this chapter, Ansel Dua does not ignore or avoid the new mestizas complexity and multiplicity. We need to learn from her as we explore the experience of the multiplicitous self in all her facets, in her moments of uneasiness, or in her moments of creativity and transformation. The Heideggerian concepts of temporality and mindness are important because they allow us to recognize on a more ontological level how the existential continuity of experience, that is of oneness in multiplicity and betweenness, can function and is real despite the confusing, ambiguous, and contradictory. Yet another instance of mestizaje provide us a few key concepts which enhance the mestizaje of multiplicity and oneness. Okay, so let's turn now to a more historical mode and to the other Ortega we're studying this week, Ortega and Gasset, Spanish philosopher living between 1883 and 1955, 
He worked during the first half of the 20th century, while Spain oscillated between monarchy, republicanism, and dictatorship. We won't talk about his interesting political career here, but rather about his philosophy, which has been characterized as a philosophy of life, sometimes as an extension of pragmatist metaphysics, sometimes as a realist phenomenology, sometimes as a proto-existentialism, sometimes as a realist historicism, and often compared to Wilhelm Dilthein and Benedetto Croce. Influences on Ortega are their complex American pragmatism, Bergson's vitalism, Dilthey's historicism and poetics, neoconscient epistemology, Max Scheller's anthropology. Heidegger's being in time, he claims to have anticipated in the readings we're doing this week many of its key insights, and he was probably right, at least in part, as we'll see, in phenomenology. That wasn't enough to make us despair of ever understanding him in half of one week. He additionally was extremely well-read and often quoted from Leibniz, Nietzsche, Fichte, Hegel, Brentano, Simmel, Croce, Collingwood, and some of his compatriots such as Miguel de Unanimo, and many others. Since I haven't read a ton of Ortega besides the lectures that I've assigned this week, and I'm more of a Heidegger scholar, I wanted to introduce, start here, the interesting relationship between Ortega and Gasset and Heidegger. Here you see a bunch of very collegial shots of them both from the earlier 1950s. When Heidegger received the news that Ortega Gasset had died in 1955, he wrote a quite moving tribute, which I'll read to you here. I'd like to briefly remember two memories of Ortega y Gasset. They remain in my memory as worthy of remembrance. The first memory dates back to August 1951. We are in the German city of Darmstadt, where conferences on a particular topic are held annually in a small setting. That year, they were on the theme Man in Space. Among the men of science and architects who had been asked to speak, Ortega and I counted each other. After my lecture, which was called Building Dwelling Thinking, a speaker began to fire violent attacks against what I had said and claimed that my talk had not resolved the essential questions, that it had rather thrown them away, that is, it had dissolved them into nothing through thought. At this moment, Ortega a Gasset asked for the floor, took the microphone of the speaker who was next to him, and said to the audience the following, The good Lord needs the dispensers so that the other animals do not fall asleep. Basically defending and appreciative of Heidegger's contribution, while at the same time compassionate towards his colleagues' insensibility. Heidegger comments, this ingenious intervention suddenly changed the situation. But it wasn't just a clever way out, it was mostly chivalrous. Of course, in Heidegger's mind, chivalry being a characteristic of the Spanish philosopher. This chivalrous spirit of Ortega also manifested on other occasions in front of my writings and speeches. It has been all the more admired and esteemed by me, since I know that Ortega has denied many of his assent and felt a certain uneasiness about some part of my thought that seemed to threaten his originality. I guess Heidegger couldn't resist a little measured jab. In the second memory that Heidegger recounts, one of the following nights I met him again at a party in the garden of the municipal architect's house. In the late hour, I was walking around the garden when I saw Ortega alone with his big hat on, sitting on the grass with a glass of wine in his hand. He seemed depressed. He signaled to me and I sat next to him, not only out of courtesy, but also because I was captivated by the great sadness that emanated from his spiritual figure. The reason for his sadness soon became clear. Ortega was desperate about the impotence of thinking in the face of the powers of the contemporary world. But at the same time, there was also a sense of isolation that could not be produced by external circumstances. At first, we managed to speak brokenly. Very soon, the conversation focused on the relationship between thought and the mother tongue, or Muttersprache. Here, Ortega's features suddenly lit up. It was in his domain, and from the linguistic examples he gave, I guessed how intensely and immediately he was thinking from his own mother tongue, i.e. Spanish. This nobility was to my image of Ortega, the solitude of his search, and at the same time a naivete that was certainly a thousand leagues from naivete, because Ortega was a penetrating observer who knew very well how to measure the effect appearance was to achieve in each instance. This is, according to Heidegger, the great charisma of Ortega. The second memory Heidegger recalls brings to mind the great open house of a doctor in the heights of the Black Forest, where one Sunday morning, in a circle of numerous listeners, we crossed with force, but with beautiful measure, our sharpest steel. The concept of being and etymology of this fundamental word in philosophy were under discussion. Of course, this is Heidegger's MO, 
The discussion revealed how well versed Ortega was in science, and it also highlighted a kind of positivism that I am not satisfied with, since I know very few of Ortega's writings and only in translation. These guys really should have read each other better. The afternoon of that same day gave myself and everyone present the strongest and most lasting impression of the great personality of Ortega y Gasset. He spoke of a subject that was neither planned nor formulated and that can, however, be based on the title, The Spanish Man and Death. It is true that what he told us was familiar to him for a long time, but how he said it revealed to us how much more advanced he was than his listeners in a field into which he had to break through. When I think of Ortega, his figure returns to my eyes as I saw him that afternoon, speaking silent in his gestures, in his noble guise, his loneliness, his genius, his sadness, his multiple knowledge, and his captivating irony, here comparing him to Socrates. Not without its mute, yet measured criticisms, this tribute to Ortega a Gasset is enormously positive. Heidegger really respected and admired him. Ortega Gasset is most famous for his book, The Revolt of the Masses, which, as the wiki notes, traces the genesis of mass man and analyzes his constitution, and also describes the rise to power and action of the masses in society. Throughout, he's quite critical of the masses and the mass men of which they are made up, always contrasting noble to common life and excoriating the atavisms he finds in contemporary mass humanity. We're not going to look at this work, but rather approach Ortega y Gasset through a few of his public lectures delivered in Buenos Aires and Madrid in 1928-9. That is shortly after Heidegger's Being in Time was published. And accordingly, in the 10th lecture, we're going to get a glimpse of his overall view of that work and situating of it within his own philosophy. These lectures were a resounding success, and when you read them, I'm sure you'll see why. They're pretty amazing. Having run out of time at this point in the semester to carefully craft my own PowerPoints on these lectures, I've included this week the excellent comprehensive outline of Lecture 1, 9, and 10 of What is Philosophy by Philip Turetsky. I'll only be covering a few points from this outline here, augmented with some citations from Ortega's text. On the topic of philosophy today, that is in 1929, Ortega notes it is more popular than ever, and making a stunning comeback after almost being eliminated in the university system between 1870 and 1920. Alas, this is no longer the case for us. We do not have a public like Ortega had who feels a need for new ideas and takes voluptuous pleasure in them, seeing in philosophy the very path to personal destiny. Ortega, and he argues this point fairly extensively in the first lecture, his era had a philosophical destiny, which was to overcome the philosophy of idealism by way of an intense focus on the very activity of philosophizing. Why the overcoming of idealism? We must remember that still in Ortega's time, the great and unsurpassable philosophies were those of the idealists and their intellectual inheritors. Not only in Germany, but also in America, the transcendentalism of Emerson, and throughout Europe, the popular writings of Maurice Maeterlinck. In the very era in which positivism was on the rise, idealism still commanded the greatest measure of respect among the lay and often pious public. It was through becoming an idealism, philosophical thinking made its mark on generations. It's only in light of this endemic idealism that we can explain hard-won efforts of sobering up, instantiated in, for example, the Marxist legacy, or in Nietzsche's great wrestling match with metaphysics. In this way, Ortega's problem is not our problem today. We lack a culture formed and forged in the thick of profound spiritual byways and idealist conceptions still rooted in part in Platonism and our religious traditions. Perhaps if Ortega had witnessed the final achievement of the destiny he announces for philosophy to overcome idealism in how it is played out today, he would lament more melancholically or at least some aspect of its return. In any case, from within the announced program of giving an analysis of the activity of philosophizing, Sounding a lot like Heidegger in the 1929 lectures, Fundamental Concepts of Metaphysics, he notes that this is not a matter of merely technical or specialized interest. The sciences have in his era already made themselves esoteric with their closed terminologies. Philosophy still has a duty to be clear and generally accessible. Clarity is the courtesy that philosophers owe. This differs from the special sciences which increasingly need their closed terminology. Methodological strictness is needed in investigation but clarity is required in exposition. 
on this path to the reckoning with and overturning of idealism, Ortega describes the strange adventure that has befalled truth in the modern period. Truths in themselves are supposed to be forever and unchanging, and yet in our mortal subjective experience of truth they are always historical, discovered at some point by some people, and they might be forgotten. This temporal historicity of truth does not affect truth itself, but only its presence to the human mind. It is our knowledge, i.e. our beliefs, our cognitive attitudes that have a history. The truth itself lacks all temporal attributes, and there might be sempaternal truths, those which last forever, only on the basis of a historical moment, as well as eternal truths which exist before, during, and after time, and thus including time within them, a duration raised to hyperbole. On the articulation of history within philosophy or taken notes, and history, if it is to be a science, must show how particular philosophical or political views could only have been discovered by particular people at particular times in particular places. This difficulty does not imply that truth is relative to the person who knows it, for we must harmonize the fact that certain people come to know a truth with the fact that truths have absolute value for everyone. Variations in thinking are due to changes in the human orientation towards truth, not to changes in truths, since there are none. What do people do with their rational element? What do people do with their rationality is to set up the a priori of their own history. Sounding here a bit like Michel Foucault, people select, emphasize certain truths and are blind to and cover up different truths at different times. Here are taken notes that the ancient and medieval definition that human beings are rational animals is still unsurpassable. However, we are no less in the dark now as to what both animality and rationality really are and entail as philosophers have always been. Minimally, we can say human beings are living beings who think with meaning, whose thinking we are therefore able to understand. History assumes its subject can be understood and so possesses a degree of truth. And so history opposes relativism and seeks reason even when it is not apparent. And this was indeed Hegel's notion of history. For Ortega, history seeks to achieve understanding of people in all periods and it takes the variability of opinions and seeks to give each period its full meaning and to discover the eternal truths in each period. And so history, which is curious about variability, and philosophy, which is curious about the invariable, can work together. Sometimes this goes disastrously wrong, however. For example, Descartes, who took invariable rationality as what is human, saw history as irrational and subhuman. History on Descartes' views is a series of equivocations and errors. In contrast, 19th century historical theory and positivism tried to salvage the relative value of each period and sacrificed eternal value or truths. For Ortega, to bring the temporal and the eternal back together again is the great philosophical task of his generation. For this, he will utilize the method of perspectivism. Ortega mentions that 1840 to 1900 was an era least favorable to philosophy, an age that would have eradicated philosophy. However, philosophy cannot be abolished. It will ever be renewed, for it fulfills a fundamental human need. Turning to this note of the theme of our times, the fundamental reform of philosophy, the basic facts of the universe, the self in the world, and the world in the self, the life of all of us, Ortega begins this lecture with a very serious ambition, that is to perform a surgical operation on idealism. Having argued in previous lectures that pure subjective idealism, above all in Fichte, has raised the level of philosophy such that it can no longer slip back into an ancient realism and innocence, the question yet remains how we can learn from and yet get beyond idealism. And so this lecture begins with a most serious task, which Ortega hopes to pull off in a matter that is sportive and jovial that aims to be philosophical through and through rather than pedantic. What a mad scientist doctor was Ortega. This is how he approaches the surgical operation on idealism. But so far, he's been tracing the purest version of the magnificent idealist thesis, which inspired most of modernity, into which we've been educated and inculcated, still constitutes the prevailing order in human culture. When idealism left the reality of the outside world hanging in suspense and discovered the primordial reality of the conscious, of subjectivity, it lifted philosophy to a new path from which the latter cannot slip back under pain of retrogression. Ancient realism, which starts from the undoubted existence of cosmic things, is philosophic ingenuousness, the innocence of paradise.
All innocence is paradisiac, because the innocent, he who neither doubts, distrusts, nor suspects, finds himself in the position of ancient and primitive man, surrounded by nature, a cosmic landscape, a garden, and this is paradise. However, in the onset of modern philosophy, doubt throws man out of paradise, out of a given external reality. And where does this absolute atom, which is thought, go when he sees himself thrown out of the cosmos? He has nowhere to put himself, he must come to grips with himself, must thrust himself within himself. He moves to ensimisimiento, to ensimisimiento, a key Spanish word in Ortega's philosophy, which he deploys to mean self-absorption or pensiveness, being absorbed in oneself or within this. It always involves an attention to that which is innermost, as well as a melancholy of youth. Modern age is melancholic, and the whole of it is more or less romantic. St. Augustine, who was the first romantic, formidable and gigantic in everything he touched, is the soul of philosophic candor. And here Ortega provides a fascinating footnote that I recommend everyone reads very carefully. It concerns the biblical myth of exile from the garden and the fundamental existential reality of human consciousness as shame. Ortega writes, is shame in all seriousness the form in which the eye discovers itself? Is shame the authentic consciousness of oneself? And in this way, the origin of idealism as a kind of self-revealing and self-hiding on the part of the human being over and against nature and expelled from paradise. For Ortega to go beyond idealism, we must preserve its insights. For after swallowing up the whole world, humanity's post edenic condition, idealism has become a swollen tumor that must be operated on. The modern self is ill, according to Ortega, is not doing so well. And this is much in contrast to the ancient self, which was, as in Plato, almost always a we and almost never an I or an ego. For Aristotle, the I soul is like a hand shaping to the world. For Descartes, the self becomes primary in the experience of truth and inwardness. Leibniz closes off this self as a monad or microcosm, the small god within. An idealism culminates with Fichte, for whom the self becomes the universe. Very successful at universalizing and infinitizing itself in interiority, the modern self nevertheless has many causes for complaint. In the post-idealistic era, it has become solitary, tending towards solipsism. It tends to think of itself, like the emperor of China, as having no equals, and yet is loath to give up its infantile sense of power in identifying the others, things, and selves around it as a you, i.e. subjects to the self or I. Ortega, the task then will be to free idealism from its isolation and to give it back the world. But escape from its self-enclosure, which has led to disillusion and nihilism. Once we are freed from idealism, we are as Dante leaving the inferno, and so we emerge to see once again the stars. Yet how can the self come out of itself without falling back into naive ancient realism? Here we must note that the ancient self never came out of itself since it had never gone into itself. The modern self must now come out of itself and yet keep a hold of its hard-won interiority. And this problem can be phrased in the fiercest form of a dilemma. Either the I exists in and for itself, or the I must find a world different from itself. To resolve this dilemma, Ortega averes that the human being must become both withdrawn and free, a prisoner yet at liberty. Ortega next notes that the desire to break free of idealism does not imply that idealism is false. Yes, there are significant theoretical difficulties for the idealist thesis, and yet it is precisely these difficulties which proved so stimulating in the search for truth. We must now be prepared for a new truth, which is when Poincaré posited 4D space well before Einstein's formulation of the theory of relativity. Truth does not arise out of desire, rather the desire for truth can only be satisfied by actual truth. If desire alone creates anything, it is falsehood and self-deception. Again, the theme of Ortega's time, its historic task, is to move beyond modernity and idealism. It almost sounds here like he's inventing postmodernism. Such a desire for change is not the merely fashionable searching after the always new. In fact, every period of history has a task. Time itself is a task. And we cannot evade the new philosophical insights, which each generation must find for itself if it is to fulfill its task. The discussion of the difference between ancient and modern thought becomes very nuanced and advanced here in Ortega. We'll skip over these pages.
what it leads to is a new conception of the self in the world and the world in the self. Here, a proto form of what he'll call our being in the world. Where else in our course will we find such a detailed philosophical archaeology of this basic existential concept, being in the world? And that alone makes reading Ortega and Gasset very worthwhile, if quite difficult. Emphasizing the return to appearance in post-conscient philosophy, Ortega will eventually here argue that the world is only what it seems to me. It is only appearance. The world, nature itself, might be merely phenomenal, and there is no obligation to seek a substance underlying appearances. This was one of the major conclusions and contributions of idealism. We find it all over the place. We cannot get beyond idealism and modernity if we do not first eliminate the prejudice that seeks a substance in the world or me. And here phenomenalism becomes strictly implied by Ortega's perspectivism. Idealism's mistake, however, was to move from this perspectivism into a subjectivism. That the world is appearance and phenomena does not imply that it depends on the subject. For the subject as well depends on the world. The I and the object remain distinct and different. And nothing truly transcendent enters into the self. Rather, it's always the world appearing just as it is. We need not go outside ourselves since our being is always being in the world. Going on a long digression into the philosophical concepts of the cosmos and consciousness in relation to the thesis of idealism, Ortega arrives closer to the end of Lecture 9 into an analysis of the life of every one of us. What consciousness is, is a reality operating in every reality. I myself, my being in the world, the being of the self, the I, is being in the world. The self is open unto a world. The self is the open being par excellence. This notion of the self, or what Heidegger would call Dasein as openness, for Ortega, one of the first major steps beyond both the ancient realist thesis and the modern idealist one. It is a new position that conserves the insights of its predecessors. The self as openness in a world consists and has its very being in occupying itself with this world in various modes, loving it, desiring it, seeing it, talking about it. And this being occupied with the world is my life. Ortega thus centers his hermeneutic and historical analysis of being in the imminence of a life, my life, in a way here short-circuiting Heidegger's attempted movement from Dasein to being itself. Ortega, my life is what is given and is the basic datum of the universe. My life is cosmic and not thinkable within the isolated self of idealism. And in here moving from my life to I find myself, Ortega seems very much to anticipate, if not in his own estimation, to have already discovered effective self-finding. What philosophy finds for Ortega is the philosophizing philosopher, the living act of philosophizing is a vital act like dancing. Philosophy is something one does, an activity, an activity, not a having or possession. And in Ortega, philosophy must begin with defining its basic datum, my life. Every other thing and manner of being, physical objects, mathematical objects, the being of things, is given only in adumbrations and hence only partially, and has its primary role in being lived by me. For all things are what they are only in regards to an appearance in my life. And so Ortega concludes the ninth lecture. To live is to go to the roots. To do philosophy of life, in Ortega's sense, is what is radical. And the new basic problem of philosophy is to describe our ways of being in the world. And here we come up against another structure Heidegger will outline, just discussed in Mariana Ortega, which is the singular mindness of every experience of being in the world which is not transferable to anyone else, and so is neither abstract nor general. Philosophy begins with its own form of life and meditates on life. This is something old and familiar, but appearing as something new and yet to be explored. Old philosophical concepts will be useless, and so the categories must be found that apply to living our life. Again, Ortega is very close to Heidegger in his search for existential structures and being in time. This task will both make what has been difficult and abstruse clear and familiar, and it will also be disturbing since it reveals life's secrets. From the title of Lecture 10, we find in Ortega no shortage of charisma, wit, charm, enthusiasm, ambition, and perhaps even a little hubris. He's clearly a philosopher that loved to be original. What he proposes to have found now near the end of his lecture course is nothing short of a new reality a new idea of reality. We'll now explore in terms of three concepts, 
the indigent self. To live is to find ourselves in the world, and to live is to decide what we are going to be. We have discovered a fundamental datum different from the cosmic being of the ancients and the subjective being of the moderns. Discovery is of a new reality, so that it is a mistake to assume that it is a kind of thing like all other things, and the terms being and reality will apply to it in the same sense that those terms have always been used. Clearly Ortega's intention here is very different than Heidegger's, and is not to rehabilitate the Aristotelian or post-Platonic conceptions of being and reality in a new historical register, rather to transcend by way of life, to become radically different from everything philosophy has considered. For this, the traditional concepts of being and reality will not help Ortega. For we need, having brought the new before us, to find new philosophical concepts, and to the extent philosophy influences life, a new life. This animating intention of Ortega's, we could say, Spanish existentialism, will also find richly expressed in post-Heideggerian philosophers, especially in Gilles Deleuze. In his clearest analyses in these lectures, Ortega now claims that the interdependency of subject and object is not merely that of the object on the subject, as idealism claims, but is also that of the subject on the object. I depend on the world. Idealism went wrong by accepting that being implies complete independence. What is given with evidence is interdependent being, i.e. being in the world. And in this sense, the self is indigent from Latin indigit, i.e. needy. I need things and things need me. We'll see this concept of indigence or need richly developed in Heidegger's later thought on poverty, need of being for man and the need of man for being. When we arrive at the end of this course, at this point we can only say being in the world is needy, not simply the needy self in an indifferent world, but a needy world thoroughly enmeshed in the dynamic interplay of beings within it, and thus being is not static. The world only functions through me and my actions within the world. This for Ortega is our life. Setting aside traditional notions of existing, being, coexisting, we can now say that things belong to living, since my life includes the world. For Ortega, this means that we have escaped from the prison of the self alone or the egocentric predicament. The world becomes the horizon in which we dwell. What then is the form of being that we call living? use traditional philosophical concepts to answer this question, which is Aristotle's De Anima, purports to give an ontology of life. It's not to say that Aristotle was wrong there, but only that we, like the Greeks, need to create new concepts, the new worlds we inhabit, lest our very living of these worlds is left out of account. Here old words take on new uses, and ordinary words come to be used as technical terms. We need to find new concepts and categories by finding ordinary vocabulary that can take on the rigor of and illuminating power of technical terminology. To do this, we must immerse ourselves in the depth of our existence. This does not imply searching for esoteric wisdom that would be the end or telos, final purpose of the search. Instead, we need to look at what we do and are as always already before us. And when we do this, we discover that to live is to find ourselves in the world method of perspectivism here being to describe the attributes of our life moving from the most external to the deepest within us, i.e. to find a series of existential descriptions of life. And here, unlike the stone, we reveal ourselves to ourselves. Our life is always an inquiry into ourselves, as well as an incessant discovery of ourselves and the surrounding world. For this we need our cognitive faculties or mind, that is the rationality of our living bodies. Without this, we would lack being aware of oneself. At last, we come in the 10th lecture to Ortega's remarks on Heidegger, which begin from the insight, here inherited in part through both William Dilthey and Max Scheller, that living comes first and then philosophizing. For living is finding oneself in the world and being occupied with beings in the world. These ordinary phrases, like in being in time, have now in Ortega become technical terms, finding oneself in the world, world, being occupied. And Ortega admits that the definition, life is defined itself in a world as a technical term, was forged by Heidegger in his profound analysis of being. Ortega very much takes his hat off to Heidegger at this point in the lecture, noting that he gave new significance to finding ourselves in a world in augmenting the ordinary spatial corporeal meaning that can be attached to these words. For if there were only bodies, then living in our sense would not exist. 
the world we find ourselves in is one in which bodies affect us, interest us, threaten us, and are agreeable or not to us. And in the strictest sense, the world is that which affects us. All busying oneself with some other thing is living in a world that is filled with other things that affect us, which we see, hear, desire, fear, love, or hate. Lastly, to live is to decide what we are going to be. Here we are not in the first instance free to be or not to be in this present world, excepting by suicide the gestures of the Hamlets and Empedocles of the world. Going on living, we are not free to choose the world we find ourselves in. Rather, we are always fallen into this world now. We not choose nor build the world we find ourselves in. It was always already concrete and has always already had a definite development. Such sudden and unforeseen finding ourselves in this world is essential to life. We are thrown into life, but what we are thrown into is always already a problem, problematic in its essence not merely we this or that particular difficulty. And life always needs to solve the problems of life, that is, of itself. If it's not predetermined, but comes to us in the form of possibilities, wherein we are always already finding ourselves forced to choose among various possibilities, thrown in the world with a horizon of possibilities, our only freedom is to act on the basis of these possibilities as possibilities. And this is freedom within the limits of fate. We are life and nothing more, and in this sense of being that is not decided in advance, but rather open, horizontal. We get to decide, at least to some extent, what we will be. Habit or inauthenticity obscures these moments of decision. Breaks in habit present us with problems. Breaks in habit, in fact, present us with problems in which we feel the burdens of life even more strongly. So living beings both are burdened and self-sustaining in a world. Vanish here is joy or alegria, and is similar to moving swiftly casting off a weight. In conclusion, we feel forced to decide what we are going to be. It is not enough to say, as we did above, that life is what we do, since it is not automatic or mechanical. The paradoxical truth of living is that we are beings whose being is not primarily what we already are, but what we have not yet become. And so we exist as open to our own most possibilities. Ortega concludes this lecture that coming here today, you resolve to be listeners, students, as any auditors getting to the end of this video so decided, but even while passively listening, you decided on attending or being distracted, on thinking about the subject of the lecture, life, or something else. And those resolved, or in Heidegger's terms, resolute on attending, had to work to keep that resolution alive and renew it moment to moment. If what we are is always open onto what we are becoming, what we are deciding to be, then life essentially involves a temporal aspect. The paradox here is, in the order of time, as future, past, present, the future comes first with regards to life. We find the past and present only with regards to what is to come, with regards to our possibilities. So much more in these rich lectures by Ortega y Gasset, so much of it leads to the need for a closer study of Heidegger. It seems to echo many of the specific claims in being in time. We will no doubt never be able to resolve the issue of originality here. Tega maintained, sometimes fiercely, that most all these analyses were ones he developed from his own readings in the history of philosophy, based on his own philosophical education, in many ways very similar to Heidegger's. They had many of the same interests, passionate investments in specific figures, above all Dilthey, Husserl, and Max Scheler. Certainly the specific form in, this, in which these ideas are couched in these 1928-9 lectures bears the mark of many of Heidegger's formulations which Ortega had engaged carefully by this time, I find Ortega's claims to originality, having already developed these analyses on the basis of overcoming both materialism and idealism, transcendentalism and empiricism in a robust notion of my life and being in the world, to be very plausible and compelling. The question I would like us to ask ourselves in the coming weeks, having read these lectures of Ortega, is whether there are aspects of Ortega's approach that in fact lead to new pathways existentialism which remain unopened up by Heidegger. I'll not answer that question here without a more careful study of Heidegger, which will begin next week after covering Miguel de Unanimo. So in closing, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture on Mariana Ortega and Ortega y Cassette, Latinx and Spanish existentialism. See you next week when we transition out of Spanish existentialism into a more careful study of the philosophy of Heidegger for the rest of the course. See you then.